clearly we are in a really black hole dominated area area since the LIGO discoveries and um, the follow-up also uh, discoveries of the neutron star binary. And um, we are in this era of multi-messenger astronomy, which is very exciting, right? Um, we have uh, quite a number of black holes. So <laughs> when I started in this field, it was pretty much all theoretical. And now we do have observations of the gravitational wave detectors of binaries, which is pretty exciting from my point of view um, and the point of view of everyone working in this field, I guess, um, because now we not only are doing models and simulations, but we have data to compare the simulation models. And then so therefore we can start doing some real astrophysics. Okay, so I'm not gonna go in detail, but I will say that the role of modeling and simulation is fairly important because, because we can do things, right? So uh, example, the serendipitous, serendipitous example is GV150914. Now it's been a long time this has been happening, but um, how impressed I was uh, that the results of the theoretical modeling and numerical activity together was really closely following um, the data that like observed in this case. So it's really, um, it's really uh, in, uh, a really a good, a, good, a good feeling being a theorist and being having um, some impact also on the interpretation of uh, the data. Okay, so as far as multi-messenger astronomy, in order to get the other type of signals, we know that we need mother, uh, magnetic fields, mothers, um, high, highly relativistic particle emission as well. For these cases, in general, we are talking about binary neutron star merger, but also accreting binary black holes, because these can produce uh, powerful electromagnetic signals, uh, as well as jets, as we know, in addition to gravitational waves. And the fact that we have, obviously, uh, a lot of new uh, observational facility come online soon, um, it, this is, makes it even more exciting from um, the theory and computational astrophysics point of view, because we, we, we want to believe that our models are really critical to interpret these observations. All right. Um, so the first question one may ask, since we have a lot of data from LIGO about binary black holes so from the gravitational wave point of view, would be, well, um, do these black hole binary emit any light at all? Well, if these binary happen to be immersed in a galactic nuclear disk, one might expect there might be some photons emitted um, from this system. The real question here is whether um, the signal is strong enough to be really detectable and will not be obscured by the presence of the EGN nearby or any other nearby more luminous um, uh, um, event that may obscure this phenomena. So uh, this is really, uh, I would say, a very interesting possibility, but I would not um, um, you know, put my bet on detecting the lights uh, for real about these binaries near time soon. In any case, I will focus mostly on the case where I think um, there will be more uh, photons emitted. And this is the case where the black holes are more massive, we're talking about the supermassive black holes, and we know that those form the centers of galaxies and the galaxy merge. So there is uh, quite a bit of expectation that um, supermassive binary black hole merger will happen. And if um, all the phenomena that we think um, um, from the theory, uh, we think that um, are going to lead uh, the binary to um, uh, approach close to merger so that the pair approach the subparsal scale essentially so that the gravitational wave can make the, the, the binary uh, essentially merge and then go into the regime where Lisa and PTA can observe them. I think that makes it extremely interesting. Um, and then finally, when they merge, we know that they can also um, uh, get kicked out of their host galaxies and therefore potentially also leading to signatures that way. So as multi-messenger source, uh, these, these uh, supermassive black hole binary um, are really interesting um, for essentially doing a number of important astrophysical um, exploration. 
uh, including exploring the accretion dynamics, the plasma physics, and the strongest and most dynamic regime of gravity. So the question is, how many we, we expect to be there? The, the real answer here, I have a, a full, a, a one slide only about this problem, but um, the real answer is really, we don't exactly know for sure. Uh, but there are um, some observation, a handful I would say, uh, where you um, can uh, interpret these observations as being binary black holes. Of all of the few that I've put in these slides, um, the first one <laughs> really, uh, I have no doubt um, because you can really see the direct imaging of the double nucleus in the radio galaxy in the first in the first uh, image here by Bansal et al. Um, in that case, uh, we do think that we have really a binary black hole, and it's in the weekly, and this would be in the weekly um, PN regime, post Newtonian regime, inspired regime. It's not really in the yet in the merger um, in the merger proper regime. Um, there are other type of observation um, that one can do, looking for periodic flares or sinusoidal light curves, like this. This uh, um, this was all over the new few years ago about Graham et al. Uh, but uh, there is still a lot of uh, interpretation that one has to do because uh, we don't have really reliable models um, to tell us what really to expect in this case. Um, the good news is that uh, we will see uh, many more binary AGN um, in the haystack because LSST is coming online and we'll have a larger sample from there. And PTA is getting also uh, close to essentially having uh, the, the capability to detect these from the gravitational wave point of view. And LISA in the future uh, is going to uh, fly not too far from the future, and therefore giving us uh, really um, uh, examples from the gravitational point of view of these of these sources. So um, there are also some theoretical estimates. If you look at the the paper here by Crowley, Volunteer, Dubois, De Vrien, they have some population estimate uh, done with um, with with their galaxy evolution models, and they find that essentially. About 100 sources at redshift uh, of 0 0.5 to 1 uh, could be really detectable. Uh, and they are, um, all of them have a period that really are in the PDA range. 10% of, of those actually have a period that are in the PDA range. So they would be uh, quite observable. And let me tell you that in this paper, I know if you read it, but they really make a conservative, a very conservative model for the. Uh, photon emissions from, the, from these binaries. So uh, I would think that um, the, the, really the picture could be brighter even than that. Okay, so if I haven't given you enough motivation why this is uh, interesting to study, let's actually go into uh, the more details of the, what it takes to really simulate these, these phenomena. So um, let's remember these are complex phenomena. So again, they are originating from the merger of galaxies um, down to the very relativistic regime where the black holes merge and emit very strong gravitational waves. So uh, we're talking here about many kiloparsec separation down to subparsec so, so separations. And it's a huge, obviously, um, uh, parameter space as well. And um, this is uh, essentially a problem that is not clearly um, kind of clearly be handled by just a one set of simulation, but one has to do um, many simulations in the different regimes and then try to learn and connect the dots among them to try to get um, to understand what happened during these final regimes here. In my talk, I'm going to be focusing mostly during the spiral regime um, and approach to merger, what's coming next. Uh, but take into consideration that in addition to the huge dynamical skills um, to really get these things from astrophysically motivated scenarios, one must resolve the small scale of the magnetic rotation instability turbulence 
so that you can do proper angular momentum transport in the in the gas. So you know these things have accretion disk. So you need to be able to calculate fairly accurately the accretion rates because that is uh, important to the evolution of the system. Uh, additionally, there is a need of putting really realistic thermodynamics and radiation transport into these models in order to really get meaningful and realistic um, light curves or spectra that we expect to get from this system. And then finally, if you're really interested in the final portion, then you also have the Einstein's equations. And so you have to be able to resolve also the physics of the black holes close to the horizon. So it's a really challenging problem. Despite that, I think it's a very interesting problem. And a lot of people have been trying to get some results. This is in my one slide that summarizes a little bit, a very, a, quite a bit of history and number of papers. So I apologize, I'm not able to put all the <laughs> papers on one slide. But let me say that this problem, uh, since it started in the 90s, um, uh, when people were trying to do simulations based on basically 1D accretion mo uh, uh, models or, you know, even 2D models, um, not having uh, magnetic fields, just hydrodynamics, then what they were finding was um, that essentially the gravitational torque exerted by the binary in the gas was essentially carving a nearly empty cavity or roughly 2A, where A is the separation of the binary. And essentially, the idea then was that, well, there is really no gas in, in the region close to the black holes. And we will call this in further in the talk cavity, just because of historical reason. But really, close to the black holes, we're going to see that the modern um, 2D simulation and 3D magnetodynamic simulation really have found that this concept of the binary torque dam does not really hold and the accretion really continue pretty much until the binary approach merger. So uh, that's <laughs> changing totally the picture because obviously that means that there is now enough gas um, to be able to be heated in the medium photons in the regions of the black holes. And the people uh, have been interested in doing full numerical simulations trying to understand um, the dynamics um, close of the gas, close to the binary. Unfortunately, with numer full numerical activity, the simulations um, tend to be very short because um, we, we do have a very complex system and, and um, it takes a lot of computer time to really, um, to really uh, run these systems uh, for, um, you know, uh, a time that is dynamically important for the uh, for the accretion uh, for for establishing um, accretion dynamics in the disk. Okay, so there is a little bit of a difference here between um, what we do for gravitational wave uh, and what we do when we have an accretion disk. Because when we have an accretion disk, it's very important to be able to uh, equilibrate. Um, and, and get the, this, the disk in the so-called quasi-steady state, okay, where um, there is no more, um, you know, variability due to the fact that you started the disk in a non-physical condition. And that typically, it's really um, takes hundred thousands, um, you know, M of evolution, where M is the total mass of the, of the binary system to achieve. In any case, so um, what I'm going to be talking today is, uh, well, we tried to do this, but we had to come up actually with some ideas on how to really um, do this in a meaningful way. So uh, for us, um, so there we decided to um, treat first the system in an spiral regime where gravity is still dynamically fairly important and emitting gravitational waves. So we're talking and we're in the post-Newtonian regime here. Uh, but uh, the gas evolution is followed in full GRMHD on this dynamical space-time for a very, very long time. And, um, and so we can't really um, uh, uh, determine what, what's, what's happening in the accretion disk that surrounds this system. For this, we have used, uh, we decided to use a well-tested flux conservative um, but generally covariant GRMHD code that has been used 
um, quite, for quite a bit in a, for single black hole accretion disk, harm 3 d which was originally developed by Charles Gami, McKinney, and Toth, but then was adapted to binary to um, my former postdoc now, of course, stuff at uh, NASA Goddard uh, um, Space Flight, Scott Noble. And, um, and we modified that, as I say, to include the space time, the dynamic of space time. This is in the INSPIRE regime. So we constructed a space time in the INSPIRE regime. So we have a full metric that satisfies the Einstein's equations uh, in the INSPIRE regime. And then we follow um, the black holes through the post trajectories. Okay, so in order to uh, do uh, what I was explaining before, you need a really long dynamic of time to essentially equilibrate the circumbinary disk. What we do is that we uh, evolve um, the binary, the, the entire system in two stages. So in the first stage, as you see on the top of the plot here, um, and uh, we do actually excise the region. Well, it's not, ex we put actually a, what we call a cutout, okay, around the binary. So this is again a binary black hole space time in the inspire regime with an accretion disk around. And what we do, because our code is, by the way, let me mention this, the code that we use in our 3D is uh, using spherical polar coordinates. The reasons why we like spherical polar coordinates is that when you're, you're doing accretion physics, it's, uh, it's much more accurate to actually determine, the, calculate the accretion rate in uh, a spherical polar coordinate, just because the system has that kind of symmetry. And so, um, so then, okay, so in order to evolve this for a very long time, we excise um, the region, or, or say, put a cutout of uh, the region into, uh, around the, black, the binary, and we follow the dynamics in the circumbinary disk. Now, uh, excising this has also the effect of really uh, helping with the current condition. If you, if you know, if you are using any spherical polar coordinate code, we have issues with the current conditions. So, you know, as you get closer to the black hole, to the black holes, but also to the origin of the coordinates, um, your dt becomes smaller and smaller, the t factor becomes smaller and smaller. And so your evolution tends to slow down and, and slow down even uh, to uh, basically being, being making the problem intractable. But because we need to evolve this for hundreds of thousands of them, that's what we do. And it's okay to do that because here we are focusing on equilibrating this region here around the black holes. Okay, so that's the first type of simulation we do. We follow this uh, accretion disk now for, again, as I say, very long dynamical times. Um, and then after we have equilibrated, and the uh, accretion disk, uh, then what we do, we take um, the actual circumbinary, evolved circumbinary disk that's equilibrated and interpolate this into a computational domain that has the black holes now on the grid. Okay. Now, let me tell you that this portion now that you evolved, the, the bottom here, you're not going to evolve it for a long time. This, in this uh, simulation that you show, uh, show here, this is actually the black holes are separated 20 m or 20 RGs, where our RG, our RG is the trash radius. Uh, essentially, what so that so the binary will do few orbits here, few tens of orbits, okay? While here it's doing hundreds, thousands on top. So, but the, the bottom. The 10 orbits or 50 orbits that the binary does, okay, in, in the bottom plot, it's 10 times more expensive than the one above because of these issues of the, of the current factor dimension. So it's extremely expensive. But with this, uh, with this technique, we're able to do it. Manuela, can I actually ask you a question before you continue? Sure. Uh, yeah. So I'm very interested in this uh, lower plot that you just showed. And mm -hmm. I guess you're still using spherical polar coordinates here, right? Yes, I do. Mm. But you see, you see the coordinates are warped. Yeah. So yeah. you see there is still a small cutout in, in the origin. Yeah. Um, but it's a really small cutout here. Yeah. yeah. And, because I'm. Um, 
Yeah, so it's really close to the origins of one am cut out. Okay. Yeah. Have you tried? And have you played around with using this llama infrastructure where we have the Cartesian okay, interior? Yes. 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 And, okay. I'll, I'll say something more at the end of my talk. About okay. That. Okay. Because I was Not just about wondering llama, how. But we have. Yeah. But we have a multi patch code that, and it's coming the next generation. Okay. Good. Right thanks. Now, so okay. So yeah. So there is two way you can handle this, and thank you for the question because. So you can either design this warped grid. So you see it's warped um, in a way that you can resolve. Uh, you see close to the black holes here is nearly Cartesian. But topologically, the grid is still spherical polar. So you still have to put a small cutout here. But you can achieve enough resolution in the region close to the black holes to really um, you know, follow the physics there with this grid. It's still more expensive, though then doing what you are saying and work i'm gonna be talking toward the end of my talk about that one good so and i think we have one right. more question in the audience yeah. so let me just hand yeah. over the microphone sure so in the bottom panel oh, i'm sorry yes. uh, could you go back to the previous slide in the bottom yeah. panel Ah, at the dis distorted region, I think the magnetic, you know, if you consider the magnetic field of the binary start, I think that numerical diffusion would be higher at the transition region. So what do you think? Ah. Okay, so we are going to see a little bit about magnetic fields. The magnetic field is important, uh, especially in the circumbinary disk, where we're going to see um, it's important also close to the black holes. Over here in this region here, it doesn't, it turns out not to be so important. We are going to see the physics, the, what comes out of the physics soon out of this, okay? So essentially, we resolve, I think we resolve the magnet, so we resolve the magneto rotational instability. The idea is to really resolve the magneto rotational instability here, okay? And then resolve the jet physics close to the black holes. Okay, in this region here, the magnetic fields really don't have a, a major role. But I think you need to see the results in order to understand this. Sorry. Also, sorry, sorry. can you say yeah. your name when you when you speak? Oh, because I don't know I, who I, you are. I, I'm 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 Kei Kotake. Anyway. Hi hi. Uh, hi hi. Nice. nice to see you. I know only by 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 name. Uh, anyway, when you change the radius of transition region, like twenty percent, did you expect some difference in the in the outcome? Yeah, have you ever? No. Changed, yeah, no. no. Oh, that's no, that's nice. No. Thanks. We thanks. That. Yeah, that's no. it. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Manuela. We, we, we try that. <laughs> yeah, we, we don't want models that depends on that, right? So I think the key thing is to resolve the physics that is important in the in the regions where you are looking at getting the physics up. So okay. um yeah, thank you. Please continue. Okay. <laughs> thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think those are all important questions. Uh and it's it's a non-trivial problem, believe me. But I think it's uh, you have to use a little bit of you know, if you want to be able to do it, you have to use a little bit of, you know, uh, predictive, predictive intelligence on how to do it properly, but also a number of tests. Uh, okay, so um, here I'm going to just summarize what we found, by the way, from the simulation of the circumbinary disk. Um, we found, okay, so that after evolving this for hundreds of thousands of M, um, we generically, pretty generically, form... Um, uh, what we call an overdensity in the circumbinary disk. And you see here, so material tend to accumulate, um, you know, in what we call the lump, which has a characteristic periodicity, which is associated with, uh, um, you know, with the characteristic periodicity of the uh, lump, which is roughly Keplerian period periodicity. But then you have the, the uh, binary here. And so, uh, the interplay between the binary and the lump periodicity give a characteristic periodicity of the system, which we call a big periodicity, which we will see. It's going to be uh, uh, present in every quantity, any observable quantity that, that we calculate from this system. The, the interesting things, uh, and this is actually this paper is in preparation, I should say, uh, it, it's an archive number now. <laughs> Sorry, I should I should have um, ad, 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 um, corrected this, but you can go in the archive and look at one of the latest papers from uh, Scott Noble and and also our collaboration, 
where he actually uh, provide um, uh, a fairly uh, interesting, um, uh, I would say maybe not super complete, but fairly complete in terms of exploring how this lamp depends on the disc size, the magnetization, and the mass ratio. And we found that essentially the lamp is pretty generic whenever um, the, the binary is, uh, has nearly you know, equal mass, but for mass ratio of about one to 10 or so, it tends to not to be there. But we're gonna see, because I think this lamp has a lot of you know, consequences. So what we did, this was, um, so work from uh, my former um, um, PhD student, Dennis Bowen, who is now a staff member at Los Alamos. Um, we, we did then take that simulation and we go, you know, we took the second plot that I showed you, put the black hole on the grid. You see this little region here that is still excised, right? But what you should see here is this lump, okay? When the binary passed by by this, by this lump, this overdensity of material, then um, the accreting material that falls into the from into the black hole, we call this stream. You see, these are streams. One of the streams, okay, get always enhanced, and the other one get depleted, and that is a continuous cycle, okay, that happened during the binary evolution which um, is you know, fairly interesting because you're breaking the symmetry of the system. now. So this lamp is really um, you know, causing uh, this uh, cycle, which uh, result in, uh, you know, on the mini disk that form around the black hole results of a depletion and refilling of periodic depletion and refilling of the mini disks, okay? So I'm going to now, uh, for a moment, a switch off on. Uh, okay, so if there is such a signal, what kind of uh, you know light signal would you expect? Okay, so we went ahead and post-processed these um, simulations and calculated the spectra to see what you would get um, uh, as in terms of what kind of light you would observe. This is the spectra, the various contribution from the circumbinary disk the mini disks and the accretion streams and the total, and you see the variability. So this was now published uh, a, a little bit a while ago, 2018, by another student um, who was visiting us from Paris. Uh, and, and so you can see, and then Scott generated these very beautiful images um, that you can see now pretty much uh, in uh, many of the PRs that you see out there. Uh, that you see these images are coming from our simulations. So they were done by, you know, uh, these are the simulations done by my PhD student and uh, Scott produced these images at NASA. In any case, so how do we calculate um, the spectra uh, and we'll see light curves is that we use this Bottrow generativistic ray tracing code for transporting radiation, okay? Um, we do a camera to source approach. So we follow the geodesic to integrate geodesics. And then we uh, integrate the radiative transport equations and we do it for high accretion rate system, which means optically thick case and low accretion state, uh, rate systems, optically thin cases. So, okay, because I have more to show you. <laughs> I wanna move forward. So, um, Remember, it's fairly important that we actually are uh, able to um, equilibrate this um, disk around the binary. So what you are gonna see in this movie generated by another one of my postdocs is the long time, I mean, it's running really fast. The long-term simulations that are done to equilibrate the circumbinary disk, you, you see it will take a while even if I've accelerated this movie, but to see that, uh, we entered the steady state when the accretion rate here is pretty much flat. That's what we mean when we are in the steady state, okay? And you see that you reach this stage at around 150 orbits, okay? Binary orbits. Now, that's, um, you know, that's quite a lot of orbits. Um, and this is in times in terms of, uh, you know, 10 to the 4M, so you can, just 
you know, uh, get an estimate, you know, here of how long this simulation needs to be before we actually stop the simulation and pass it to the second set of simulation that evolved the black holes. Okay. What you also see by this paper here by um, another postdoc of mine, Lobes Armengol, is a, a simulation that he has done that where now he included spins into the um, black holes. And we see that actually um, the spins have an, uh, an effect on also the circum binary. Um, so essentially, nearly the cavity, not far there here um, in the region, farther away from this, but in nearly the cavity, as closer you get to the black holes, um, you see an effect of the spin. And we're going to see how actually this become even more powerful when you now put the black holes on the cavity. And again, this, oops, I apologize, it went farther. Let's see if I can play this movie. So this is a simulation by done by Luciano Combi. Uh, actually, it's no longer in preparation again, so I should have paid attention. This is a paper in the archive. Um, and he's a um, PhD student in Argentina who visited us. And he's working on this problem, on taking those simulations that you've seen before and uh, giving you now to spinning black hole binary. The spins in this case are um, 0 0.6. And what you can see um, is the following. The, the takeaway from this simulation is that um, the, um, and the spins are aligned, by the way. This is the case where the spins are aligned with the orbital and the momentum. Uh, spin, total spin of 0 0.6. And you can see that the mass in, uh, uh, that accumulate in the mini disk around, uh, around each of the black holes is twice as much. And uh, in the periodicity that we saw before uh, associated with the lamp exists also in this case. And this fairly close to the previous periodicity. But the key thing is that these mini disks here now are more massive. Um, and the, so therefore there is more material that accumulate close to the black hole, okay? And so what happens now, you would expect that you have spins. There is a more magnetized mass close to the black hole horizon. There are ergospheres. And so you would expect more jet structure. And indeed, that's what we find. Uh, and <laughs> actually, if you have spins, you, find, you will find outflows that are nearly 10 times as stronger than a non-spinning case. So here you see the spinning case on the top. And again, let's consider this is the 0.6 case only, not 0.9. We're doing 0.9 right now. But for 0.6 spins, so you see here the pointing flux, um, uh, so, okay, what are these lines? These are the bound, uh, the right line is for the bound material. Um, the dashed one is for the magnetized material. And so you can see, uh, which pretty much define the regions of the jet, right? This is the polar view around one of the black hole. And so you can see how in the spinning case, this is much more enhanced than in a spinning case. Again, so this is the, Jet power, again, all right, non-spinning case uh, for the two black holes and the total, the two black holes and the total. And you see that the jet power is definitely much larger um, in the spinning case and non-spinning case. You can see also the modulations happening and those mod modulation again is following the filling and, um, filling and depletion cycles we spoke about before. Okay, let me see if I can show you. This now, okay, so now we, again, ray trace these things to actually look at what, how the spectra uh, look like in this case, the variability of the spectra um, for the various components. In this case, in the top is, um, again, yeah, for the various frequencies and the various components. And here is, um, um, is for um, various masses. So you can see how the spectra change uh, depending on you are in the lizard regime or the highest mass that PTA should be observing. Okay. Um, so I'm not going to say much about the actual model here, but let I me mean, just play this because I think it's interesting. So this is again um, the optical depth over here. And you see the light curve, okay, as you follow these black holes. 
the light curve that comes out of this system. You can see the red dot here <laughs> following. And uh, here below is actually the light curve for the spinning, uh, the, comparing the spinning versus the non-spinning case, the spinning in the blue and the non-spinning in the red. And you can see that the luminosity is really um, you know, enhanced in the spinning case. Uh, in the video that played before, this is actually um, the uh, luminosity of the jets. So this is the same um, uh, that we have here, but we have also looked at the emissions from the jets. And uh, the conclusion from this work, which I hope is going to get public, uh, going to get out there in maybe a few weeks uh, in the archive. Um, we are right now revising the, the last the list the last version of the paper for this. Um, so this has been done, by the way, by um, Eduardo Gutierrez, who's another PhD student in Argentina who is collaborating with us. And um, so the, the takeaway message is the mini disc around spinning black holes are much brighter. They produce uh, more variability in the X-rays, variability uh, in the light curve and that flows continue to follow that of the accretion rate, which is essentially modulated by that lump. Okay, so let me just go ahead. Ma Manuela, 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 before you continue, we have one more question in the audience. Oh, sure. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, I'm Kay. Sorry for, uh, please accept my apology uh, for uh, inter okay. in in okay. interrupting your nice talk. Anyway, so my question is so simple. So do you calculate the, you know, X-ray spectral uh, on the fly? I mean, the, the, no, the, no, no, okay. it's a post-processing. No, I, I, I wish we could, uh, but radiation transport is a very complex phenomenon, as you probably know. And what we are doing, as a, I think I went probably too fast here, if I can go back with my slides, okay. At in this stage, okay, we are actually right now doing uh, improving this um, with a Monte Carlo type of radiation transport. But let me, ooh, how far that was, I think. I think I may have lost it. Oh, here you go. We are not right in those, in those spectra and light curve that you see, okay, this is a general realistic ray tracing code that is done at the post-processing level, okay? It's not, so we integrate geodesics, okay, um, lights, okay, like so ray tracing. Um, and then we, we have radiative transport equation models, okay, um, that we use to, for, for different uh, accretion type models, so high accretion and low accretion, okay. But we don't do, uh, do live radiation transport in these simulations, at least in not in what we are presenting here today. First of all, it's because it's extremely complex and we hadn't yet reached this, this uh, stage. But uh, as you know, radiation transport is very complicated to do. It's also uh, very computationally demanding, uh, but we are working toward that. Okay? So this is a, a little bit the short answer to you, but, or maybe more than one. Okay, thank you. Uh, please continue. Yes. Okay, let's see where we were. Okay, so, but you can still obtain like curves, you can still obtain spectra with this method, yes. And more than anything, I mean, where we are also interested here, is looking at the effects of spins. Um, now imagine that the spins do not end being aligned, okay? There's a lot of literature out there arguing that the spins should be aligned with the orbital angular momentum um, if there is gas because the accretion torque will uh, tend to uh, align them with the, with, the, with the accretion disk. But it's really unclear what happened in the relativistic regime. It could be, for a reason or another, that actually the spins are not going to be aligned toward the end. And if that's the case, um, then um, there's quite a little bit of interesting things that could happen because um, if the black holes are spinning, they're spinning very fast, they're jets. And you can see in this little toy model here done by uh, 
Luciano Combi, uh, the jets could really be interacting. And so there we could be seeing also interesting signal from the interactions of the jets. So that's an interesting scenario, again, that we are exploring. I don't have results yet on that, but that's the next thing we're going to do um, as well. I think it's exciting. Oh, well, we have some simulations. I'm not going to present it. I think because how they asked me about this, I'm going to have to talk about this. This is actually uh, the future of this type of simulation. Uh, we're not using LAMA healthy, but we're using a new multi patch scheme that we developed um, that works more at the moment um, with, um, with the Harm 3D. Uh, framework, we call this Patchwork MHD, okay? Uh, Mark Cavara, this is now 2001 to 2021, um, uh, times pass. <laughs> this paper should be, should be up, but essentially, so what we do is uh, we um, now um, have this spherical grid, but also have a scheme that uh, will allow to put a um, different type of uh, grid structure um, and on the on the on the system, and we can use any type of grids, the spherical, Cartesian, cylindrical, um, to treat different different regions of the space uh, we are evolving, um, and we can even do different uh, physics um, and temporal skills um, on each of these patch. And this was work that is based on this. Um, now, 2018 paper that sh by Shio Takwa, where he only did it in hydrodynamics, and my former postdoc, Mark Abara, developed and extended it to MHD, to treat their MHD. And uh, what we are you're going to see here now uh, is the treatment of a simulation where we repeated we're using this system. And pay attention, and this is something that the Ontario people like it tremendously because this system allow us now to do the simulation with 30 times our prior efficiency. So that is amazing, but obviously because now what you're gonna do, you're gonna see, you're gonna put, you're gonna see the grid here. Well, the grid is being obviously uh, for visualization purpose derefined. There is much, there are many more lines there, but essentially the idea is that in close of the binary, you don't need spherical polar coordinates. You only need spherical polar coordinates here, okay? Because that's where you need to resolve fairly well the angular momentum transport. Here, a Cartesian grid is fairly fine, so you can get away from, with your problem and current condition here um, because the system is not particularly spherically symmetric here. Okay, so the simulation is going on. Now, okay, so it's stopped. And um, okay, start again. <laughs> so this paper, which I hope is going to get published soon, um, from Mark, um, you know, will have uh, the results from these uh, simulations now done with the multi patch scheme, and um, we could analyze um, many interesting features thanks to that, um, and get the resolutions to do so. You see um, interesting structures um, around the mini disks. First of all, uh, one takeaway would be that um, there is some 3D structure that that um, you know you don't see in this um, in the equatorial view, but if you do the polar view, you see some interesting 3D structure into the dynamics of these uh, accretion um, disks. The mini disk around each of the black holes are really nothing like the single black hole disk that we're used to see. Okay, so they're fairly different, and um, and again, you know, there is this accretion streams that uh, fall, falls into the mini disk, and then th you see also something that I hadn't had the time to mention, but you see kind of roughly a continuous plot here, right? This is the uh, circumbinary accretion disk. The black holes are here. Black holes are here. Okay, the mini disks are here, and there is a lot of interaction here happening between the black holes as well, and the, the two mini disks and the black holes. You saw it in the previous equatorial plane uh, movie as well. So the system is all one. So you have a circumbinary disk that forms this lump. Then there are streams, materials accrete through the black hole, form the mini disk to these streams. 
the streams get enhanced or depleted depending on how much they get material from the lamp. And then once the minute is formed, depending on how the spins are oriented and how high are the spin, the minute this can become more or less massive and they can exchange material. The two mini disks will be interacting and exchanging material. So it's a really holistic system here. So, okay. Um, so what, what we want to do, obviously continue this exploration now that we have the tools to do, to do it um, and to do it better. Obviously we have to improve in our radiation treatment um, and that's where we're working on that too. I haven't been, um, I don't have a lot of time to explain what we're doing, but we are working on a Monte Carlo uh, scheme um, for our, you know, your, your different type of radiation treatment that you can do. And that's the one that we are working on. And um, yes, and uh, we want to explore also um, various, uh, not, not just change the, uh, the black hole spins and masses, but also do eccentricity, tilted disk, thermodynamic property and so on. The key was though, to really uh, get to do this efficiently because the simulation that I um, presented before, the exciting results what I think, uh, and the first light curves really took each of these simulation a million of CPU hours. So they're really expensive, all right? So with these new tools, I think we're gonna be able to do uh, really cool stuff. Um, so stay tuned because I think uh, hopefully <laughs> uh, my students and postdocs and collaborators um, will be uh, leading some more interesting projects along the way. And I don't know if I have time here. Yeah. Do I have time? I think our Ariana Morgia Bertier said something um, about binary neutron star simulations. Uh, yeah. Just want to mention this one. So I, I would say since we already had a lot of questions, so if you want to take another three, four minutes. Uh, just one minute. Mm -hmm. So for binary, you know, you're doing GRMHD, binary neutron stars are fairly complex. You also have neutrinos in this case. Um, our, our, you know, you saw from the type of simulation that we do, we do not tend to use the one code, the one super code uh, idea, okay? We tend to use multiple codes and then make sure that we work a lot in trying to make sure that these codes, uh, you know, can talk to each other in a way that we can do consistent, um, consistent physics across. So that's the same, the same thing that we're going to use here for binary neutron stars. And I'm going to play the movie here because this is a handoff of a simulations done for a code Illinois GRMHD, a handoff to a harm 3D simulation, the same code that we're using for binary black holes. And you can see, you see, essentially, you see nothing in the transition here because essentially their handoff is done so well that you see no, no transition between one code and another. But then at the end, you see that the code is actually evolving the spherical polar coordinate, which is better code in order to treat their um, the accretion disk that form around the, the, the remnant black hole or the remnant objects around from the, from the coalescence of binary neutron star. And I will stop here because I, I know that um, Ariana has has introduced this topic, so I'm not going to go further. And I'll take your questions. Okay. Thank you.